Welcome back to the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. We come now to lesson number seven of our series. This one is entitled, The Conflict, Grace or Law. The entrance of so many Gentiles into the church posed a number of questions, but chief amongst them concerned the doctrine of grace. Were the Gentile believers obligated to live under the Mosaic law, including circumcision? This obligation was necessary for Gentiles entering Judaism but was it also necessary for Gentiles entering the church? Paul and Barnabas, having completed their first missionary journey, probably arrived back in Syrian Antioch around the year 48 AD. They were greeted warmly and gave a full report of all that had happened on their journey. Everyone rejoiced at the news that so many Gentiles had believed and churches had been established. God truly was extending His grace to the Gentiles even though there had been difficulties and persecutions in reaching them. But the problems were really just beginning. The Gentile outreach was certainly understood and accepted in Antioch, but how would it be received in Jerusalem? The issue had now to be confronted. Are we saved by grace alone through faith, or by grace plus obedience to the law? We can find this same conflict going on in the world today. There are still false religions that seek to use God's grace as a means to enslave people with man-made rules. There are even Christian churches where legalism has watered down the gospel. Christians should be cautious about the churches they choose to attend. And we should always be prepared to examine every teaching against the pure and undefiled scriptures. The good reports about the Gentile outreach quickly reached Jerusalem. The story is related in the 15th chapter of Acts. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. These certain men of Judea were most likely from among the temple priests who had become followers of Jesus during those early years in Jerusalem. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Acts chapter 6, verse 7. Many of these priests were still clinging to the law of Moses, and understandably so. Most Jewish believers still thought that Christianity was dependent upon Judaism. They did not recognize it, as Paul did, as something completely new, the fulfillment of God's plan. In the book of Hebrews, it is written that Jesus Christ, by His own blood, is the mediator of a new covenant, and as chapter 10, verses 19 and 20 calls it, a new and living way. But the legalists of the old covenant did not recognize this truth. The issue had to be settled. So the Antioch church sent Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. In reply, Paul and Barnabas related the events and miracles and the response of the Gentiles to the gospel. Much discussion and debate followed. Finally, Peter and James, the brother of Jesus, spoke. The Gentiles were not obligated under the law. Rather than place a burden upon them, the Gentiles were encouraged in their faith through a letter. The only restrictions were those that existed before the Mosaic law was written, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which, if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well." Acts 15, verse 29. One might assume that this would have put an end to the controversy, but such was not the case. The Judaizers continued to force circumcision and legalism 
on the Gentile believers. They would continue to resist God's new plan for decades to come. It prompted Paul to defend the gospel of grace in his open letters to the Galatians and to the Romans. And though it is no longer Jewish in focus, legalism and ritualism is still prevalent in the church to this day. Now what can we learn from this? First, most congregations have extremists among their members, whether legalists who put themselves and others under all manner of man-made rules, or libertines who wrongly believe they can do whatever they want in the flesh without spiritual consequence. And the false doctrines and dissensions these extremists spread within the church are often more destructive than attacks from outside. Like a virus that infects our entire body, once it gets inside us, the church body can be infected and weakened or even torn apart by spiritual viruses that call themselves Christians. Jesus' warning to his disciples to beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees is advice we ought to take seriously. There is a second lesson to be learned by the decision of the Jerusalem Council. It confirmed that the church is something new, still grafted into the vine of spiritual Israel, but free from the burden of the Mosaic Law. The church is under a new contract in which God grants salvation by grace to anyone through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The righteous of the Old Testament had a requirement to submit to the law, but by faith they looked forward to the perfect sacrifice who would finally deliver them from this burden. Rightly dividing the word of truth, as Paul wrote to Timothy, includes being able to differentiate that which is under the law of the Old Testament or any other man-made rules from that which is under grace of the New Testament. Pastors and teachers have a great obligation to get this right because, generally speaking, as leadership goes, so goes the congregation. When the scriptures are taken out of context, when they are interpreted to suit some preconceived notion or compromise to fit the existing culture, they lead to false doctrines that can condemn the speaker and the followers. Therefore, because sound doctrine is so vitally important, Teachers will be judged more strictly when they stand before God. James chapter 3, verse 1. We come now to an incident which Paul uses to argue justification by grace rather than the law. It is a useful study here because it also illustrates the difficulty many of us have in applying what we know to be true. This is the way it has always been for Christians. Understanding God's Word is not our greatest difficulty. For Christians are indwelt by the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth. Our greatest difficulty is in consistently applying God's word. And this incident shows us that even Peter, the leader of the Jerusalem church, sometimes had difficulty putting into practice what he preached. What we know is this. At some point in time, most likely after the Jerusalem council, Peter went to Antioch to see the Christians there. Paul tells us, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. We don't use that word dissimulation today, but we know it, its meaning by another word, hypocrisy. Even saying the word leaves a bitter taste in one's mouth. The world is quick to discredit Christians with that label, and sincere Christians dread being associated with the scribes and Pharisees whom Jesus pronounced curses against. So Paul tells this story only reluctantly to make a necessary point. The incident is only mentioned in the epistle to the Galatians. Even Luke does not write about it in the Acts of the Apostles. But it was hypocrisy on Peter's part. Have no doubt about that. And here's why. If this took place after the council in Jerusalem, then Peter was acting rightly when he first came to Antioch. He ate and associated with the Gentiles as though he were a Gentile. But when Jewish representatives came from Jerusalem, he separated himself from the Gentiles. This was hypocrisy. And Paul confronted it publicly 
If this took place prior to the council, then again Peter was acting hypocritically because he was there in the household of Cornelius when the Holy Spirit proved that salvation was also for the Gentiles. But why did Paul confront Peter publicly? Shouldn't he have gone to Peter privately, as Jesus taught in Matthew 18? Well, we don't know all of the facts. It may be that Paul did approach Peter in private, but Peter didn't listen. We just don't know. But allow me to suggest some other reasons why the rebuke was public. Peter was a recognized leader of the Jerusalem church. His actions made an impact in regards to the policy and doctrines of the church. And this concerned a fundamental principle, whether anyone could be justified by faith alone. Peter may also have been confronted publicly because his actions led others astray, even Barnabas. Also, the injury, the doubt it created in the Gentile believers was public, so the confrontation had to be public. And finally, Paul's later instructions to the churches included this rule. The leaders of the churches, even the elders, should be confronted publicly when they sinned. Paul wrote, Them that sin rebuke before all, that others also may fear. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. Paul does not tell us the result of this confrontation, but there is nothing in Scripture that would indicate a lasting grudge. It's likely that Peter repented and Paul's authority as apostle to the Gentiles was preserved. And as far as we can tell, no animosity existed between Paul and Peter. Think about that for a moment. How many of us would humble ourselves as Peter did in this situation? Peter was not the same man that he was when he first followed Jesus, acted and spoke rashly, looked for a fight when Jesus was arrested and later denied Jesus three times. The Holy Spirit had done a wonderful work in Peter. Instead of bearing a grudge, Peter later defends Paul's teachings. In his second epistle, Peter wrote, And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. How many of us are mature enough to accept correction from a fellow believer? Too often we react with immature responses that come from fear of losing face. We ignore correction and consider the one instructing as an enemy. How sad is that? Consider the Proverbs 15, verse 31 tells us, The ear that heareth the reproof of life abideth among the wise. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, and he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. And in 27, verse 5, we read, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. If we love each other, we will hold each other accountable. Paul was not Peter's enemy, and Peter was not Paul's enemy. They were brothers in Christ. Both Paul and Peter demonstrated the love of Christ. Paul by speaking the truth, Peter by repenting and growing yet wiser, and increasing in understanding. Paul later expressed his hope for Christians, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. We need to strive for maturity in Christ. A sign of spiritual maturity is when we are willing to speak the truth in a loving manner, even though it might hurt another's feelings. It also means willingly listening to and considering criticism, even if it might hurt our feelings. If we are easily hurt and hold a grudge when someone rebukes or corrects us, then we prove that we are not wise. Was there a positive outcome from the Jerusalem Council and Paul's rebuke of Peter? Indeed there was. Paul's doctrine of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone, could now be preached with full acceptance from the church leadership in Jerusalem. The death and resurrection of Jesus had torn down the dividing wall between the circumcised believers and those that were not circumcised. As Paul wrote to the Galatians, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. As far as the church was concerned, the question had been settled. 
but Paul would suffer much more persecution in the years to come. The worst of this was not from within the church, though he would repeatedly have to correct false beliefs and confront false brethren. The biggest personal dangers would come from the zealous Jews living under Judaism, Jews who rejected the gospel entirely and still lived under the old Mosaic law. To these unbelievers, in the futility of their wickedness and unrepentant hearts, the question of God's grace versus law could never be settled as long as the Apostle Paul continued to live. Thank you for joining us for this subject. Now would be a great time to consider your own understanding of grace. And join us for our next lesson when we study Paul's second missionary journey. God bless.